Welcome back to Principles with Corey and Logan. Uh, today, we've got an awesome, awesome conversation for you. Today, our guest, his name is Gerald Leonard, and I know this is going to be good. He's got a wide variety of uh, topics that he has expertise in. And so he is the publishing editor, CEO, and founder of Leonard Productivity Intelligence Institute. Uh, but he's also an author of a few books, and he's got a new book that has come out. It's called A Symphony of Choices About Mentorship. And uh, me and him were talking before we hopped on here. He, he says something I just truly love, and I, I, <clears throat> I know he's going to talk about it, but he says mentorship is like the HOV lane for your life. Now, I'm, I don't want to steal your thunder, but I, I, I love that. <laughs> I think it's great. But, Gerald, welcome to Principles with Corey and Logan. Uh, Corey, thank you so much. I'm really happy to to be here. Um, you know, besides being the CEO of uh, Leonard Productivity Intelligence, I'm also the CEO of a company called Turnberry Premier that provides consulting to major corporations and federal governments and things like that. So um, I'm really happy about what's going on. And I'm excited for us to have this conversation. And you are correct. It is the HOV lane. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that. Well, Gerald, you you are actually, a, you're highly sought after. Uh, you know, you've been on platforms such as NPR and Jack Canfield's show and others. Yep. And But I, I would love to really kind of, that's where you're at now, but take us on that journey. How did you get to where you are now? Take us on your, your, your journey there. Well, you know, um, I grew up in Lakeland, Florida, Central Florida. My, my dad had poured concrete. My mom was a seamstress. And I fell in love with music at an early age. And it was really the principles and lessons that I learned as a kid in music. It didn't dawn on me at the time, but it was some of the things that I learned. You got to practice. Um, you got to join a band. You got to learn how to play with others. You have to really listen to understand the music. You got to be open to all kinds of music. You got to be open to all kinds of people. You always got to have a coach or a mentor. Um, and you always got to be curious about what's going on. So those lessons have helped me through undergrad for, for, ma for my music, doing my master's at Cincinnati Conservatory, even spending a year in New York uh, at, at, uh, through Manor School of Music with Juilliard with a guy named David Walter studying bass, playing in New York. <clears throat> I did some ministry work for about six or seven years while I was still playing music. And then, you know, got married and had a couple of kids and decided I really want to keep playing. Uh, but I didn't want to be on the road. And because of my faith and my background, I really didn't want to play bars and all that stuff. So I was doing a lot of shows, uh, classical jazz concerts and things like that. And then uh, to supplement my income, I started doing IT work. I've got computers. And over time of doing both, and I already had my degrees, so I went after a lot of certifications in project management, IT, and things like that. But over time, I started noticing that if I would go to a musical performance, um, you know, I, I wouldn't know the people, you know, it's like a band they put together. But after the second rehearsal, we're all best friends because we're like connected with each other. We've been playing for a couple hours together. Emotionally, we're tied in because we're like the music does that. <laughs> but then I would go to a business project because I became a consultant and everyone's really sharp. Everyone's really smart about what they're doing. And we got the with the charter or the, the mission for that project. And we're all kind of in there. And I was like, this is a lot like playing music because everybody's coming to the table. They're smart. They, but then they, they know that they have to uh, subjugate their skills to the bigger picture of the project. And then whoever's up, let's say, well, they are doing requirements or they're doing some development of development work or testing work. That person's kind of like a solo and everybody else is supporting them. You know, Hey, what do you need? Do you need me to write this for you? Do you need me to help you with this? Can you test that again? That's like playing solos when you play jazz, right? Because the musicians are taking turns. And so over time, I would do a lot of speaking. I became the president of the Microsoft Project User Group in the DC Baltimore area for about nine years and doing a lot of speaking. People would come up and talk to me about my music background and my ministry background. And again, as I did all of this, the, the germination of all these ideas began to come together where when I wrote my first book, Culture is the Base. Right. Think about think about company culture or, or a cu the culture of a, of a of a of a nationality. It's a feeling. It's an emotion. 
right? It's history, but it's also an emotion. Well, when you hear a great bass line from a song, what is it? It's, it's As soon as you hear it, it's an emotion. It, br it brings up where you were when you first heard the song. My next one was called Workplace Jazz because work is now being done in small teams, in big companies. Well, what's a great example of a small team? A quartet, a quintet, a trio, musicians playing in a small group where they have to really rely on each other. <clears throat> that happens in business as well. And then a symphony of choices when we have all of these things coming at us and we have to make sure we're making the right decisions as we're managing life. And what do we need more than anything else when we're going through that? We need a mentor. And as I always say, mentorship is like being in the HOV lane on the highway. Because if you're by yourself, you're stuck in traffic, no matter how hard you're working. But if you're in the HOV lane, you can put it on cruise control. You're getting there faster and you're enjoying the trip because you got somebody to talk to. Yeah, come on. Wow, that is, I love it. <laughs> and you, you you were kind of, I love the variety and experiences that you've got. And um, yeah, there's something in the early part of your story that stood out to me. Uh, you said music was kind of like life in the fact that you, you always need a coach and a mentor, but there's something else. You said being open to all kinds of music. I'd be curious to hear, like, um, what's the importance of that? Like, um, like not just and I guess I, I guess I see this in that learning phase where you're starting to grow and learn in your music, being open instead of uh, focusing in on one genre, I, I guess. But I would just love to hear your thoughts on that. Unpack that a little bit more. Open to all kinds of music. When I, when I first, sure, when I first thought about that, my focus was on as a musician, especially as a bass player, I wanted to make a living as a musician. And I didn't, I wanted to be in a place where if someone says, hey, we have, you know, a Bill Blast show coming up uh fashion show coming up and we need someone who can read music and play all kinds of music i could play that role um when i was in college it was hey we had the cincinnati ballet and we're doing tchaikovsky and i need you to play you know i need some bass players i could do that um when a, a guy who was running a show and doing broadway tunes and some popular things came up i need a bad i need a bass player who could play all kinds of music i so i was able to work as a musician because I had that variety. But the other thing I, that was important, and I love traveling internationally and going to other countries. And here's why, is that when you experience another genre of music or another culture, and you're open to understanding who they are, why they do things certain ways, it broadens your horizon and you see the world in a new way. And your, your, your brain will never go back to what it was. Because now you're so much more open to and understanding what people are going through and what society is going through and the challenges that everyone has and how much we have in common. And that's what's cool about music is that it doesn't care what color you are. It doesn't care you know, what part of the country you grew up in. It doesn't care about your religion. But when you get together and you start playing those notes, it just, it's like a muse. In fact, that's one of the root words of music is muse. And mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like a spiritual thing that connects you. And pretty soon you're kind of communicating without talking because you're, 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 you have that connection that happens through music. But when we are open to each other, to learning and growing, we can do that also without even having to be musicians. It's just about being open and it broadens our horizon. We see more of the world and we, we experience more of life and what it's meant to be. Yeah, I love that. And and it's interesting, as you say that, as you get those experiences, it, you, I love what you said there, your mind will never go back to the way it was. And uh, we, we've been on a couple of trips and just been all over the, the country, we've been a few places out of the country. But it's interesting seeing different cultures. And like you said, yeah. it's kind of like, wow, that that's interesting. Because what I found is what we don't, uh, maybe something we've never experienced, or we don't really know, we tend to judge. Right. We, we tend exactly. to judge that other culture or, or it's kind of like <laughs> if if you got some friends up in the D.C. area and they're listening to this conversation, they think I'm the one with the accent. Right. <laughs> and if I were listening to them, I was like, they're the one with the accent. What's wrong? With exactly. that? <laughs> uh, but anyway, I love that. I, th I think that's great. I love that spot on. I, I, I would love to hear more about your thoughts on the HOV lane and having uh, mentorships. Obviously, you, you talk about that because you've probably experienced that in your own life and yes. um i would love to hear your thoughts on the benefits that you have kind of received from from being the mentee and then being the mentor okay. as well because there's benefits to both right sure. i love it 
<laughs> it does it does benefit both. So as a mentee, the first time I learned about being a mentee is that if you look over my shoulder, you see a red guitar hanging up on the wall. Yeah, that was my first guitar. And actually, it was my sister's guitar that I stole from her. <laughs> and so I learned how to play it. And I got pretty good playing this guitar. She let me have it because she's realized she wasn't gonna play it. And I wanted to join a band. And one of the guys in the band was like a phenomenal guitar player. I knew I was good. I wasn't gonna touch this guy. So I became the bass player. And as I became the bass player, you know, you go to a certain, you get to a certain level, you listen to the radio, you pick up tunes and you're like, I want to do more, but I don't know how to do more. Yeah. And so I was the youngest of six mom, you know, dad poured concrete. Mom was a seamstress, right? Working family. So we want to do a bunch of other things. You had to go out and make some money. So I had to go out and do lawns. I had to go out and mow grass, you know, you know, mow people's lawns and make some extra money to, to then go find a teacher who was a better bass player and pay him to teach me and tell me how to get better. That lesson never left me as a kid mm. that, that you have to be willing to do some work to make money, to then pay someone to invest in yourself, to help yourself to grow. So in doing that, going to college, obviously I had great professors and great teachers, you know, especially being a music, a music major, I had a teacher, you know, besides my college professors, I had a music teacher who was really gets into your life. But then when I got into professional world, I wanted to grow, you know, as a basis or in consulting. I found I would look for other consultants who were really good at what they did. And whether they knew it or not, they were mentoring me. Yeah. Right. Because I would I would watch them and ask them questions, whatever they talked about, whatever books they mentioned, I would go and buy whatever podcast they say we're listening to or webinars they talked about, I would go and listen to. And so I just kind of kept that curiosity. And, you know, interesting, as I got later on in life here, a few years ago, let's say now, almost almost 10 years ago, not quite 10 years ago, in 2018, I had a major bout with vertigo. Mm -hmm. And vertigo, you know, room spinning, whole nine yards, but it wasn't the normal kind of vertigo. and they had to rush me to the hospital that give me some drug to make it stop. <clears throat> I spent a day and a half in the hospital and the only way I could come home was I had to show that I could use a walker to scoot myself down the hall mm. because I'd literally lost the ability to walk and it impacted my right inner ear nerve by 86%. I only had 14% capability. When I finally went to the doctor, he asked me like, okay, how are you even hearing because you've lost so much capability? But that happened six weeks before I was to deliver a TEDx talk. Oh, wow. So here I am six weeks, you know, looking out thinking, I got this talk I got to deliver. Now my talk is, is called What If Practices Performance to Neuroscience of Music? And I'll talk about how I got into neuroscience as well. But, you know, as I lay there in bed thinking, is this my life? I just made a goal of I'm going to deliver that talk. And so I kept rehearsing it in my head, even though I had, I felt like I had been hit with a baseball bat and I felt like I had a concussion. I kept rehearsing it. And as soon as I could get it up and hold onto the walls, I used the walker to go to my office. I grabbed one of my bases and I played a little bit. I said, thank God I can still play. And I played a little bit, went back to sleep. The next day I felt a little bit better. I kept playing and every day I would play some, walk a little bit, play some, walk a little bit. Within three weeks, I walked into the doctor's office unassisted. Hmm. three weeks after that i walked on stage and delivered my talk my doctor told me i'd already been doing my my therapy because music activates the brain in a way that if there's damage it'll rewire itself and that was one of the things i learned in my research so whether it's reading books to be mentored through that process having a coach to work with me through my speech uh, having the doctors and the neurotherapists, the, the neurological therapists there to teach me brain gyms and other exercises that would help me rewire my brain. I've leveraged coaching. And then after that, I found coaches on neuroscience and productivity that now I still have what some people would call it a disability. I call it a constraint. I still have that challenge with my vestibular system. But since that time, I have become more productive now than ever before. I had already written my first book. I've written two other books. I've started 
both of my company, I, had, I was doing, had one company as a consulting business. Now that's a full fledged business because I had an investment in it. I started the other company and now I've, I've, I'm speaking in different places. I've traveled internationally. I've gotten remarried because I went through a whole thing, bought a new home. I mean, it's like, there's so much more you can do when you position what you're going through and it's your mindset and how you talk to yourself. And a lot of that I learned from working with mentors and coaches. Yeah, that's powerful. I love that. Um, something you said early on, you said, I want to do more, but I didn't know how. And that, that is the power of mentorship right there. And I, I, exactly. I found him, Yeah, and I found it in my own life too, right? There are things you just don't know that you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. But there, right. there's like this thing inside of you is like, I want to get there. I, I came across this book recently and I think this is going to go into to some of the things you'll talk about probably um obviously we only have 24 hours we can't create more time those kind of things but the guy wrote a book called uh bending time and in there he he mentioned something you just said it's um learning from mentors learning from people who've experienced those things so you can bend time or maximize time by learning from their their experiences Right there. I, I would love to hear more about um, you said that you've kind of now more productive. I, what, are, what are some of the things that you do that have kind of enhanced some of your productivity? You know, one of the biggest things that I do is and I learned this from Jack Canfield is whatever goal you have, identify five things a day or five things, you know, on a regular basis that you can focus on that's going to get you there. And you don't have to have a big complex system. I actually have a sticky note that I have on the screen. And it just basically says your top five actions for today. And then I'll write, I'll, literally, I'll, I'll write a new sticky note every day. And I carry it around with me in my wallet or on my phone or on my tablet. And those are the five things that I have to get done. And I might not be able to get them all done today. So I'll rewrite the list and move what I don't get done up front and I'll add more to it. But by prioritizing your, you know, scheduling your priorities, a lot of times people try to just run their schedule. The best way to get things done is to schedule your priorities. So you have to step back and go, okay, what are the things that I can do to move the ball forward in my life? Well, one of the ways to do that is, and this is going to sound contradictory, is in the morning, I do yoga. I do yoga exercise. Why? Because doing that yoga exercise, and especially since the neurological issue I had, it reduces stress from my body. It's like when you have, it's like after taking a shower, you don't take the soaky rag and just hang it up, right? What do you do? You squeeze it out. You squeeze all that water out of it and then you hang it up. Well, that's like, your, that's what we need to do with our bodies. We need to wring the stress because every stressful situation you experience, your body will hold on to it's somewhere in your muscles, whether it's like a pain in the neck or pain in the shoulder or my leg hurts. That's your, that's stress coming into your physiology. Wow. And by doing yoga and things like that, you're able to reduce that amount of stress. When you do that and you practice also um, meditation or, you know, whether it's Bible study or whatever, or meditation time or quiet time, then it opens you up to intuitive thoughts. You start getting thoughts like, oh, you know what I should do? I should do this. I should do that. You start getting all these new thoughts about where to go and what to do. And again, here's something I really believe in that I've learned from one of my mentors is that transformational change happens because of transformational knowledge. Mm -hmm. First thing that happens is you learn something new. Then you're able to do something new and then you'll be able to become someone new. But if you're if if you're not reading new books or meeting new people or experiencing new things, then there's no new thinking. And you just kind of, you know, you kind of find yourself in a trance just repeating and doing the same thing every day, every day, every day. And the only way to break that cycle is by, excuse me, is by reading new books and interesting books, even books outside of your 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 business area or books that you might not thought about reading before and just, just, just read it for the fun of them and see what you learn. Yeah. And then practicing and meeting new people, those, those few things, a to-do list, yoga, meditation, being open to intuition, 
and learning learning of transformational information that then will allow you to transform in other ways. It's really about that's really has has made a big impact on me um, and my productivity. Love that. Learning something new, doing something new to become someone new. I like that, right? You, you're learning something new. And then I love the fact that you you brought in the doing something new because a lot of times uh, I, I, I'm a I'm a recovering content junkie, right? I I consume a lot of content. <laughs> I love to read the books, and um, but I, I found that I wasn't doing a lot with it. And once you do something with it, now you you implement it. At least to what you just talked about, you become someone new. Uh, for for Christmas, um, I ask. I love to read, but I, I'm like what you said, man. I gotta I gotta consume more, right? <laughs> so, exactly. But here's here's the thing with consuming more. You want to do it in a way where you don't want to overwhelm yourself. So I always, you know, I, I have a little note to myself: just get one percent better every day. Yeah. If you just if you just you know one percent is not a is not a big change. But if you just every day you're looking for how can I do something better? How, how can I start my day better? How can I uh, run meetings better? How can I mentor my team better? How can I be better towards my wife? Or how can I make a better dinner? Just one percent, not not no big jumps, because then one you're more open to it. Resistance, which usually when you try something new, usually you run into resistance. And resistance says, Oh, don't do that. You're gonna change. This is gonna hurt. Oh, don't do that. Right. And resistance shows its ugly head every time we try to do something great. Well, by doing only one percent, resistance is like, oh well, it's only one percent. I'm not gonna bother. So it doesn't come up. And the amygdala, the part of our brain that gets afraid right? The amygdala is a part of our brain. It's like the deer in the headlights. The deer runs out, it sees the car, it goes, ah, right? <laughs> and, and it just freezes. Why? Because the amygdala is kicked in and it doesn't know what to do. Well, if I'm only doing 1% to get better, then there's nothing for my amygdala to be afraid of. So I can get 1% better. But if I continually do that over and over again, then I'm getting better consistently and continually. And I'm not feeling overwhelmed by everything that I'm reading or overwhelming myself by take, trying to take in too much new information. Yeah, you you made two great points. I love the simplicity of what's the five things I need to do today to get moving in the direction. And then right. just 1% better. I want to read yeah. you a quote. Um, we're, we're launching a mastermind group and we're going through the book, Think and Grow Rich. And in there, he makes a statement. It's kind of along the lines of productivity. But this is what the author said. He said, if you are one of those people who believe that hard work and honesty alone will bring riches, perish the thought because it's not true. Riches <laughs> or your goal, whatever you want to call it. He's talking about riches here. When they come in huge quantities are never the result of hard work. Wow. I would love to hear your thoughts on that, Gerald. And I would, I would say I totally agree. Uh, because you know here's the thing is um uh, think of hard work as you're in the car driving in traffic and you're you're commuting home that's hard work by yourself you're 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 pressing on the gas you're pressing on the brake you're pressing on the gas you're pressing on the brake and you look over and you see two people in a car in the HOV lane and they're going 65 miles an hour there's nobody in front of them and you're going they're in HOV lane <laughs> <laughs> you know, now you're mad at the HOV lane, but it's it's only for people who are willing to take somebody with them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being in the HOV lane is a lot easier because I rev my car up to 65, 70 miles an hour. I put it on cruise control and I lay back and have a conversation. Watch out for traffic. I'm not, you know, going 10 miles an hour, seeing that the guy's trying to cut me off you know, wearing out my brakes, wearing out my engine, running out of gas, that's hard work. And really it's the same philosophy in business. Um, back in 2020, I had a company invest in my consulting practice. Okay, so think about that. I had a consulting practice, me alone, mono y mono, trying to make this thing work. And I had some great clients. I was doing some great work. I was making a great living. I was making a great living. They bought 49% of my business. It opened up the doors of the things that I could do with my business. 
Now I'm 51% owner of my business and we're seventh going into eight figures in the business. Wow. Where if I was trying to do that by myself, it wouldn't have happened. Hmm. And I've made more money now being 51% owner of the business that's making money than being 100% owner of something that's still trying to make it all work. And again, I wasn't doing bad by myself, but, <clears throat> and I'm working less because I have a team around me. And obviously, you know, when you do those kinds of things, you really have to do your due diligence to count the costs and figure things out and so on and make sure you know the people you that you're, that you're going to be working with and you trust them. But if I was trying to do what I'm doing right now by myself, it would be impossible. When I wrote my first book, I had probably one or two people work with me on that one. When I wrote my second book, I had a publisher and I had a couple of people working with me. When I wrote the third book, I had a team because I had learned through the literary process of writing books and then marketing the books that this is a team effort and you got to you got to recruit the best people around to help you birth this book and then you got to have the best people around that can help you market this book and take it into the market. And so trying to do things by yourself um, will only get you so far and, and you'll hit a plateau, but you really have to partner, work with others. And like I said, you know, bring some, invite somebody else into the car with you so you can get an HOV lane. Yeah, I love that. And I would totally agree with you. I would agree with the the quote. I've got a friend and uh, like many people, he he wore hard work as a badge of honor. Nobody got there before me. Nobody, you know, I was the last to, last to leave all of that. And he said he realized he looked around and saw that nobody seemed to work as hard as he did, but he was being outproduced by pretty much everybody. And so not all activity equals accomplishment. And I love the way that that you're talking about that. Totally. Agree. Exactly. Well, here's and here's the thing about the five things a day. It's not just any five things a day. It's not, it's, it's not just any five things a day that goes on my list. There are things that, that are happening on my business that are getting done that I don't do. I either automate it, let the systems do it, or I have a couple of virtual assistants, or I have an employee do it. The things that go on my list are things that will move the needle. Every single, every single thing that I put on my list is going to move my business forward. If it if it's not going to move my business forward, then it doesn't belong on my list. So then when I'm working on my five things, and even if I say today I've gotten one of the things done, maybe two of the things done that I need to get done on my list of the five or six things I have on my list, I'm okay if I finish the day out and I don't get anything else done on my list because the things that I did get done have moved the ball forward. Yeah. And are making an impact on the business. And so it's really making, it's, it's it's something I teach and it's it's called project portfolio management or prioritization management. How do you select the right things that will move you forward while you're expending the least amount of energy to get them done? Yeah. Uh, Gerald, let me ask you this. So say somebody, and I'm all in on everything that you say, somebody's listening to this, like, man, I, I love yeah. that. How do I even start, man? Like, where do I even start at? With this, if they were coming to you and you were going to coach them up, what would be the first thing sure. that you'd say to them? I'd say, well, think about this. When you go to the grocery store, how do you start? You get a cart. <laughs> <laughs> and before you get a cart, more likely your wife has said, honey, here's what we need for dinner tonight. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you and so you're thinking, well, we need starch, we need some meat, we, we need some vegetables, we need something to drink. So you so what are those things? Those are things of a balanced meal. Right. So you step back and, you know, your cart might be, again, the sticky note, right? The, the uh, Some post-it notes and you just get a pen and you go sit on uh, outside or you go sit on, on your on your couch or sit at the table and just ask yourself, for me to move my business forward, what is the most important thing I should be doing right now? Hmm. And then just stop. And if you don't know, ask yourself that question again and then go outside, do some gardening or go for a walk or go hit some golf balls or do something. Because here's what happens when we do that. And if we and we get to a point where we get stuck and this is where the neuroscience comes in, right, is our brains. And this is everyone's brain. It's not just Einstein's brain. It's not just, you know, the smartest person in the world brain, Bill Gates brain or somebody like 
everybody has a brain that has this capacity. It's called, we have a conscious mind, we have a subconscious mind, but we also have what's called a non-conscious mind. Because let me ask you this, do you tell your heart to beat? No, it just, it's it's beating. But there's a mind that runs that. Do you tell your digestive system to digest and your elimination system to eliminate? No, there's a part of your brain that does that. That same part is available to you if you know how to tap into it. Mm -hmm. So here's how you tap into it. You have a problem and you say, okay, I have a problem with this. Ask yourself, how do I fix this blah, 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 whatever that is. Write it down somewhere. And then ask your brain to work on it. Literally just say, hey, I need your brain. I need you to work on this for me. And then go do something else that's not related to that topic at all. Because think about it. When have you gotten some of your best ideas? Most people say in the shower, um, driving down the street, uh, when I'm taking a walk, um, when I'm doing something other than that thing. And reason why is that that's your non-conscious mind that is so much larger than our conscious mind that has gone out and figured out what needs to be done. And then it comes back and says, here, here's what you got to do. And it's really that simple. Now, it's a lot more complexity to that behind the scenes, but we don't have time to go into all of that. And neither would it matter if we didn't know all about that. All we need to know is that we all, if you're listening to this, you have a brain that is an amazing, that has amazing power. And you just have to know how to use it, how to tap into it, because, you know, it it calculates how far you see. It calculates, you know, even if somebody's walking behind you, you, you they haven't touched you, but they've, they've, they've infiltrated your energy field. So you feel someone by you. That's your non-conscious mind. That's your energy. All of that plays in part. And if we know how to leverage that and tap into that for our own good, then that can take us so much further in life. And we can not just get stuck, but really, you know, find ways to really move forward. So I would say, you know, get a notepad, ask yourself that question, and then give, you, give your brain time to work on it and then come back. You'll get some great answers and then start doing just one thing at a time. Yeah. I love the simplicity of that. A lot of us, I think we're looking for something complex. Yeah. When, when a lot of times the answer is simple, but the things that are simple to do are also simple not to do. And uh, go for well, here's it. the thing you got. And here's the thing you got to think about. If you want something complex to go with that, what we just talked about, think about it this way. If you put your feet together and you draw a circle around your feet, that's the size of your conscious mind. OK, you got that picture about, about the size of a bucket, right, that you put your feet in. Now, put a dot in the middle of that bucket and then go out 11 miles from wherever you are. Think 11 miles out to where you are and then draw an 11-mile circle around. That 11-mile circumference or radius, that's the size of your non-conscious mind. Mm. It's like a trillion to one yeah. when it comes to the size of, our, of what our minds are capable of. And so the complexity is in all of that, you know, th that connection there because even walking down the street, our minds see more than what we're aware of. And that's why we start getting gut instincts like, oh, something's not right here. You haven't physically saw it, but, you're, but your non-conscious has seen it. And it's saying, hey, there's something that's not right here. And next thing you know, there's this to happen or that happened. And, but you get the idea. And so there's complexity in there, but it doesn't have to be complex. And it can be very powerful. Yeah. Done a lot of a good bit of study on on conscious mind, subconscious or mind or non conscious yeah, mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I find it super interesting, and your some of the examples you're sharing. Another example that I'm sure everybody is listening is you've walked into a room and like, man, there is something, something off, so, something. Or you talk to somebody, I don't know about that guy, or I like that lady. You know, there's there's something you're picking up on. I would be yep. curious from, from some of your research, because I, I find that topic very, very fascinating. Um, somebody, what, maybe, maybe if, if you can help distill this down to some, some simple stuff too. creating those sure. new neural pathways for people, new ways of, of thinking. Um, because typically I, I coach as well. And um, a lot of times it's our beliefs that hold us back. Like some of those, those, 
invisible barriers that we have are in our belief system. Yeah. Any any thoughts on how to create those new ways of thinking or new neural pathways for people? Sure. So so one of the ways to create new neural pathways is to one, there's a couple, there's like I'd say there's three main things you want to do. One is you want to identify your goal. Mm -hmm. So write out a goal, you know. I want to make X amount of dollars by this year, this time, so on, whatever case may be. So you got a goal. Now I want you to take that goal and turn it into an affirmation. Now, an affirmation is a positive statement that you're making about yourself of what you want to be doing, but you're going to write it as this if it's already happening, because that creates a discord, dis uh, kind of like a disconnect in your brain, but it also creates uh, some dissonance where your brain says, wait a minute, you're saying we're this, but I know we're not this, but how are we going to get there? And it starts saying, oh, this is what he wants to do. So now the non-conscious starts going, okay, I got to figure out how to get this for him because now he he's written his affirmation and the affirmation is, I'm so happy and grateful that I am blah, 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 blah. And these things are happening and so on and so forth. So it's basically, it's what you want to have in the future, but you're saying you're stating it as if it is now. And then you want to read or write. It's 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 great to read it. Like if you read it in the morning and read it at night before you go to bed, it's better if you write it because when you think about it, when you say, um, I need to remember that. So what do you say? I'm gonna write this down. Mm -hmm. Right? Everybody does that. Do we know why? When you write something down, you it's a kinetic energy. And it literally brings the brain cells closer together. So it has, so there's less room and it has the, the least amount of space to jump for you to remember. That's why when you write stuff down, you remember it better because you're actually moving the neurons in your brain closer together to remember something. So imagine taking your goals and writing them down as affirmation, as positive things that you will always remember where you're going. And you turn on what's also called the reticular activating system, which says, filter out all the other garbage, focus on what he's just wrote down, right? So write out some goals, <clears throat> write out your affirmations. And then the third thing is when you get a negative thought, money doesn't grow on trees. I mean, how many of us have heard that? <laughs> right? And I would challenge that. Money does grow on trees. You got orange trees, you got apple trees, you got bananas, you got grapes. That's money. That that can be taken down and sold and turned into money. Money does grow on trees. So a lot of things that we know that that are negative thoughts, I'm not good enough, I don't look good enough, I'm too white, I'm too black, I'm too green, I'm too blue, I don't speak the language, my accent, whatever those negative thoughts are, write them down and then ask yourself, has anybody ever told me that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so where did I get that from? Well, okay now. And what you'll discover when you ask yourself a number of leading questions that way is that you've actually just made that up. Or you've heard someone else talk about it and then you applied it to yourself. And what we believe and think is actually how we see the world. And, and, and so we start putting caps on ourselves. So by, by writing out those negative thoughts, and looking at them and challenging them and asking, where did that come from? Has anyone ever said that to me? Has, has, has anyone ever pinned that on me? Have I ever, you know, where, do I, where have I seen that in my life? And what you'll find is that the majority of those things are just things that you've made up. Yeah. And you go, okay, I made it up. I'm going to let it go. And you move on. But by writing out your goals, doing that and then challenging your negative thoughts, you'll be amazed. It's like, okay, I'm driving with the gas on, but I've also been driving with my foot on the brake <laughs> because I've been listening to those negative thoughts. Affirmations and, and addressing your negative thoughts, you're not pushing the gas even harder. You're just releasing the brake. Yeah. It's really powerful. I, I hope, uh, I hope, I hope you really took notes. I hope you really listened to anybody out there because because what you got is you got you just got a master class on that. Uh, and and simply figure out where you want to go. That's that's your goals. Having some affirmation written in the present tense of I am this, whatever it is. And then those negative beliefs, you challenge those beliefs that 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 that's not who I am. That's no longer who I am. And then writing it down. 
I, I have a big question for you. Okay, Gerald. Yeah. I would love to hear your honest, honest thought on this. Okay. Okay. I'm a person of faith as well. And I can yeah. hear that you are, you've been a minister. Our brothers and sisters in the faith have the biggest issue with this. They have, yeah. they, and I would just love to hear your, any advice, like, um, because a lot of times, oh, that's a little too new age for me. I don't know about all that. Um, yeah. Any way you can help help them out, because it's almost like this fear to set goals and even to step forward when, man, the world needs you to step forward into that. So anyway. Exactly. It, it really does. Because here's the thing. You know, David in the Bible said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about all the things I just talked about, that's us being fearfully and wonderfully made about how we are created. Right. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that that's what we worship. Yeah. You know, we still are created. We still are a created being. So even having all of these amazing things about us, it's still who we have been created to be, which means there still is a creator who made us this way. And, all, and the focus is not to build, I would always say not to worship, you know, yourself or the creation, but to worship the creator. And, you know, there's also a passage um, that talks about, the, you know, the rich fool. You know, he goes and gets wealthy and he says, hey, I'm going to go out and build bigger barns. I'm going to tear this one down and do this and that. And I, I text my buddies up in Maryland who are also very spiritual guys. I said, you know, I said, as God is working things out and blessing my life, my goal now is to build bigger arms, and not just bigger barns. Mm. Because when you build bigger arms, that means, OK, I'm being blessed so I can serve and more. I can give more. You know, one of the things I do with my clients, and I shared this on a meeting I was in earlier with the national conference group. And I said, when my clients bring me on, um, I look at the the benevolent organizations that they're involved with, whether it's, you know, um, um, organizations or, or groups that, that are marginalized or whatever. I will then say, okay, part of the profits or a portion of the profits that you're paying me I'm going to contribute back into your community for that organization. So I'm going to align my company with where their mission is. And as I bring in a new client, they're in an effort city, heck, where I'll figure out what's there going on in their city. And then a portion of the profits will go to supporting them. What is the client going to do? The client's going to go like, wow, here's a guy who gets it. It's not just about making money. It's about making a difference. So we're going to give back. So if I'm building bigger arms, the barns are going to take care of themselves, but that's not my focus is how build, how big can I make my barns? Because at the end of the day, you can't take it with you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you can't take it with you, but while you have it, if you are able to, then we can use it to make a difference in people's lives and really still have in mind that it's the creator who gave us the ability to have these things and that we're cutting ourselves short and we're, 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 we're really not um, being good stewards of what he's given us. If he's made us this amazing and given us these capacities to do all these amazing things. And we, we cut ourselves short because either we're afraid to be great because we think, okay, if I do that, I'm not going to be able to handle it. I'm going to, I'm going to get too much ego going on or you're, you're just not comfortable with it. But I would say, be who you are, be who you were created to be. Just remember your creator as you do it. Amen. Yeah. I like it. Well, Gerald, I tell you, you have added a ton, a ton of value to our listeners today. I, I love it. I feel like we could talk good two or three more hours. Uh, we just really feel like I'm scratching the surface <laughs> on, uh, with you there. And I know you've got a new book out. Uh, can you tell yep. us brief uh, a little bit about that and where someone could go to get that? Okay, so the book is called a, the book is called A Symphony of Choices, and it's how a mentor taught a manager decision making, project management, and workplace engagement, and saved a concert season. It is a business novel that teaches some core principles around how to do executive decision making how to get things done in very complex organizations and how to get buy-in from team members and get everybody on the same page and manage this while your life is in crisis and everything else is going on, you know, 
COVID and this and that and all these different things that are happening. And yet you still figure out how to make it all work because you have a great mentor who's kind of guiding you and you're slowly, you're taking his advice and you're following through. So it's really a good read. You don't have to be a musician to understand it. Um, <clears throat> if you've listened to a symphony or listened to music on the radio, you, you're going to get it. Um, but it really teaches you some really cool principles. And it's, if you've ever watched any, you know, like soap opera or kind of a uh, Ted Lasso or one of those shows, uh, the the book is written that way too. So, so when you get it, it's a page turner. And again, I, and I can say that confidently, not because I'm the author of it, but because I had a great team. I really did. I had a really great team that gave me really good advice and to make sure that it was a well-written book, it was a well-designed book. And then John Wiley and Son, uh, one of the largest big pu bu book publishers in the world, uh, bought the book and published it. And there's an audio book coming out here as well. Yeah. And if people want to learn more about me and, and uh, just what we're doing and what I'm doing, uh, the website, ProductivityIntelligenceInstitute.com. Now, if you go to forward slash uh, Corey Logan, right? go to forward slash Corey Logan, that'll take you to a dedicated page. And I'll give you the link uh, that you can go there. And, and I have some freebies there, some things that you that will really help you with your career and your business and your productivity. If you want to bo book a call with me, I'm available for a, a 30 minute free consultation or call, an introductory call. You can also find out more about my book. You can connect with me on LinkedIn or my social media from that same page. And it's just for your listeners here. Uh, for anyone who's listening to to us in our conversation to go and learn these things. Wow, that's awesome. Well, Gerald, you, like I said, you have added a ton of value and we'll make sure to have that in the show notes. So you can uh, definitely, you guys can definitely connect with Gerald. And I uh, just want to say thank you for all that you've done and all that you've shared, added a ton of value. And um for those that are listening, thank you for taking a listen. If there's something that Gerald said that really, really resonated with you, or maybe you want, you've got questions, feel free to reach out to him. He, he will, like I said, we'll have the links below, but if there's a comment you want to leave, we'll make sure to share that with him. Uh, make sure that you stay up to date. You like, subscribe, Principles with Corey and Logan. And if it has impacted uh, you, share it with a friend or family member. We'd love to, love to uh, see that. So thank you guys. Hope you have an awesome, awesome day and God bless.